Matthew, welcome to the GRDC and Conversation podcast. I'm looking forward to, I know we've had a little bit of a, a chat off here and I'm looking forward to continuing it now with you. So welcome. Cool. Thanks, Ali. Yeah. Mate, um, I'm interested. We're back in your hometown. Yep. Um, Toowoomba. How, how long have you been back living here for? Uh, about 10 years, I guess now. Yeah. And a, quite a big road in between. Uh, Time-wise, not ge- geography-wise, not not all that. Um, you know, did the obligatory disappear overseas after finishing uni, but um, uh, then down to um, Moree and uh, Warwick, and then through back, back down to Moree, and then back back up to here. So yeah, not not a not a not a massive geogra- geographical spread. All within the, within the same area. Where else did you head overseas? Uh, just to England. Oh, um, yeah. So eighty two when I finished um, vet studies, uh, the the vet market was there wasn't a, there wasn't a job to be had in the in the in the country. So I think probably about eighty percent of my year disappeared overseas within within six months and and did locums uh, and that sort of thing in the in the UK. I, I headed up to the north of Scotland and. Um, I had a fantastic, fantastic time up there for for um, well, nearly a year, and then then back home. Isn't it um, forty years as worlds away from where the vet industry was to where uh, it is now? Absolutely, it? yeah. the The shortage, the shortage of well, I'm not, I'm not sure. There's a shortage of uh, small animal vets, but the shortage of production animal uh, veterinarians appears to be pretty critical. Absolutely, and we've got some views on how that. Could and should be solved. Solved, I think, and it, uh, but um, uh, it's part of, part of that overall problem of attracting people into the sector. We'll have to bring that back to episode two because I think today what I'd be really interested um, to to draw out from you is your perspectives around, yeah, you know, I guess especially the grains industry, but that road for you and the involvement in in the sector. But starting off the involvement in in farming and agriculture, growing up in and around Toowoomba, like I'm, I presume it was always on your radar as a vet, but why did you leave the vet profession to pursue farming? Yeah, I, my dad was a, a suburban architect in Toowoomba, so yeah, Toowoomba was a country town back in those days and I get, arguably still is, so you're surrounded by ag, but in our family, no, we, 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 we were not, not a farming family. But for some reason, it always my holidays were always on mates' farms. You know, I, for some reason, it was always what I wanted to do, uh, and I did vet science with the an idea that that might lead lead me there. Um, it, it and maybe it maybe it did, but the the first opportunity was a, a Dean Starman who was a Lived in Toowoomba. I used to treat his wife's dogs, and one day he said to me, well, "How would you like to come down and manage a farm?" And uh, I said, "Yep, absolutely." And uh, um, and went uh, went down to Moree. That would have been about nineteen eighty seven. Why was it such an, I guess, an interesting pursuit for you? Why Why did you jump at it? It's just growing things, creating things from the soil and sun. Uh, you know, is is I don't know. I don't know why it, why it is, but it, it's it's endlessly intriguing and, and endlessly satisfying. And you know, right from a young youngster, I guess I always was that intrigued and fascinated me growing vegetables, all those sort of things. I, I just thought it was I just thought it was amazing, and the opportunity to do it and get paid for it, man, that that sounded pretty cool. What kind of property did he get you down managing? Uh, it was a pecan farm, a well, pecan nut farm. Yeah. Um, I remember at the time saying to him, Dan, uh, why do you want me to do this? I don't know. If, I don't know much about farming. I, I know I want to do it, but I don't know much about it. I don't know anything about agronomy. I don't know anything about engineering. I don't know anything about agricultural finance. I don't know anything about, I don't know, all the other uh, big list of things I didn't know anything about. And he said, yeah, he said, yeah I know. I know. That's, so that's good. So you'll worry about it all. <laughs> and... Uh, I think that that actually has been good advice for me, and that when you do employ someone who is good at something, they have a tendency to want to do that at the exclusion of of other things. So if you're hopeless at everything, you might actually become. <laughs> how do you how did you find on. that not completely overwhelming going into the proper deep end? Uh, I'm not sure. The crew down there were were all old hands. I just kept asking a asking a lot of a lot of questions. Um, 
And the advantage of the pecan industry is that it didn't have, in Australia at least, it didn't have a tradition of how you did things. So uh, we could we could start from scratch. And Dean Starman himself, who owned the property at that time, was was always open to a new idea. And you know, he, he, his constant refrain was, uh, "Whatever you do will be wrong, so act at once. Uh, you know, move forward." find a better way every day. Um, and we, you know, I think we did, um, we did find, find better ways. Um, we, we managed to get that orchard up to being the top performing pecan orchard in the world for nearly 10 years. Wow. Um, and I remember going across to the States to give a talk at some US thing and I said to Dan, Dan, we don't want to tell these buggers over there how to, how to do it. And he said, oh, don't worry, Matthew. They won't believe you, and uh, <laughs> and he was perfect. He was perfectly right. So it, yeah, the the advantage was that it. I wasn't trying to repeat the past. I was. We were trying to build the build the future, and that's you know that's how you should approach any form of, pretty much anything. The past is useful, but not not that not not that guy not that, not that good a guide as to what you should do tomorrow. How long into that like tenure do you think it took you to start to get comfortable and confident in the role? I don't think I ever. No, I don't. Always think, on edge. Yeah, no, I don't think that. Yeah, we, no, we, no, no, still not. That didn't. Ever, that didn't happen. No. <laughs> Tell me about that relationship that you had between the owner and, and yourself, because it sounds like it was a pretty special relationship. It it was. Um, so Dean at that time would have been about over sixty, I guess, and looking to retire. We 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 used to argue incessantly, I guess, um, but he was open, but. Uh, you know, we had to to win an argument was quite a quite a serious uh, quite a serious endeavour. So I got my I did my homework before I uh, went and had a crack at things. Uh, but yeah, we we continued to be very good good friends. I worked there for ten years. At which point in time, I was keen to to expand that that business. Um, and then. Well, at that point, what you know wasn't he was he was happy to to sit on it. So, and I'm I've one thing I have learned about businesses: if you if you flatline, it, it is very difficult to retain good good talent, and that's a that's a challenge for agriculture, and particularly a challenge for the family farm. Um, that that flatlining is 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 there's probably no sort of financial reason not to flatline, but um, there's a, a yeah, talent won't won't stay. Not that I was great talent, but yeah, good people don't stay around a flatlining business. Um, and so yeah, I, I I moved on at that point, but continued to have pretty much not nightly, but at least two or three times a week an hour's conversation with him. <laughs> really, <laughs> but, you were that invested in the business? Yeah, or well, together he we would just uh, you know discuss and argue yeah about about how <laughs> uh, and I'd tell him what a stupid idea he, what a stupid things he was doing and he'd you know easier to throw rocks from the outside. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you move on to? At that point, I actually bought uh, my, my wife uh, Jenny and myself bought a small uh, irrigation block out towards Warwick, um, and I thought. You know, I was a farmer now. I'd done it for ten years. I could do this, um, and we bought the block. Uh, pretty quickly realised that um, that uh, yeah, you need a second job if you're going to survive off a, a thousand acres of, of dirt. Um, and so I I managed to secure the role of director of the National Centre for Engineering and Agriculture, which might sound like a bit of a strange gig for a veterinarian. Um, at, which was based at USQ, and I spent ten years there, principally focused on irrigation management research, and we established the CRC for irrigation futures. Again, it was about, and it was during that period of of uh, water policy reform uh, and a very rapid expansion or improvement in irrigation efficiency. So it was a it was a pretty exciting time to be involved in. In that area, and that, yeah, I be, I did did begin to learn a fair bit about uh, that. This idea of doubling water use efficiency was not not very difficult at all. In fact, quadrupling it would be a better would be would, would be a better. We've doubled it 
across the industry pretty much in the last 20 years. We better get ready to do the next doubling. Um, can, can you explain that to me a little bit more? When you say doubling water use efficiency, is that in particular crops or just across the? Pretty much across the board. Um, uh, efficiency is, is the output divided by the input, so it's bales of cotton per megalitre of, of, of water. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it used to be one, it's now two or, f- two or more. Um, and you can do that. And if it's tomatoes, you can do it with tomatoes. You, you, yeah, so that's the basic driver is to increase the efficiency. It's not to say it's megalitres per hectare. That's not an efficiency. That's an application rate. That's, you know, it doesn't really make any difference how many megalitres you put on. It's what you get off. Mm-hmm. And I think we can continue to look at that. The sort of things that the easy um, wins that we've had over the last 10 or 15 years or 20 years have been associated with the losses that occur in, agri- in, in irrigated systems. So losses below the root zone, deep drainage, lo- evaporative losses, water logging, you know, those types of things. I think maybe we've, we've, we've got most of those easy engineering or hydraulic fixes. Now it's probably uh, continuing to look at the agronomy side of things and, and genetics to try and Get the next stage up, but yeah, I'm sure I'm sure we'll continue to uh, to drive down that track. And you mentioned cotton there as I guess the the key measure of metric. Were grains a, a true focus in that irrigation CRC as well? No, they they weren't because I guess um, we were. I was mainly based in the with the summer rainfall zone, and irrigated grain cropping is not not a significant. Part. Cotton was the was the is the primary user of water in the in the northern basin um so grains didn't yeah the focus wasn't associated with irrigated grains production of course in southern in in the southern part of the system grain oh we yeah we we did do quite a lot of work on on rice Mm -hmm. of course they've they've achieved extraordinary improvements in their efficiency um but the same opportunities exist in grain if you're going to irrigate the issue is can you make enough money out of grain to bother applying the water to it in the first place? That's that's the challenge. How did you go going from, I'll say, like the, the growing pecan business back into the research development landscape? Peak, within the pecan game, we were fairly we were a fairly intensely R and D focused business. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we had done a. Uh, I, I had done a lot of research within that within that um, business around, firstly around uh, pest management. Um, we managed to. I remember the the first year I was there, I put fourteen aerial sprays across the farm to control uh, a borer and green vegetable bug. I think about ten of them were a product called Hallmark, which is one of the synthetic pyrethroids. A horrendous thing to think that. I could have done that, but we and it, and it didn't work. And uh, I remember saying to Dean, "We're not winning here, Dean." And he said, "Well, what are your options?" And I said, "Oh, well, we could stop and find a better way, or or try and try and hit them harder next year." And he, and 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 he said, "Which one do you want to have a go at?" And I said, "I think we might have a crack at at stopping." And that we then did a, a pretty big research program with Syro over a five or ten year period and managed to to go cold turkey on, on insecticide inputs into that farm from that date on, and there's never been a pesticide applied to that farm since. So that was a big wow. research program. Same deal on irrigation. Um, an argument that I didn't, I didn't win with Dean, which was that we could convert the whole farm across to drip as opposed to flood. He couldn't quite get his head around that, given the fact that the whole US industry knew for certain that pecans died if you tried to irrigate them with drip irrigation. I'm not exactly sure why they died, but that, they knew that for certain. So we, we didn't make that change at that time, but we'd done the research to prove it, that they didn't actually die, but he, he wasn't a great believer in... In research. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, no, he was a believer in research. He, just, he wasn't a great believer in that, in that shift. Well, you know, one thing I've learned on this trip um, through chatting with all sorts of different people, and I'll say... And I think this is the complexity of agriculture when it comes under the umbrella. But, like, I, yeah, I just thought across the board, crops were getting sprayed with 
insecticides, pesticides, whatever it might be. But the advancement in the the use of chemistry and and science in the paddock it has actually blown my mind over the last couple of weeks. It is. There's there's a lot of things that that should be blowing your mind. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, pest management certainly is one of them. That that shift that uh, to be able to go cold turkey and pecans is is a bit of a unique opportunity. Uh, orchards in general, they're not monocultures. They're they're you know, they're actual full-blown ecosystems. They've got an understory that you're growing all sorts of weird and wonderful things, mostly weeds, uh, but they've got pollen and with pollen becomes the ability to feed beneficials and have this this uh, biodiverse uh, environment. So orchards are in- intrinsically easy things to achieve a biocontrol environment in. That A cotton monocultural cotton crop is difficult. Um, one of the things that we bred up to control this borer was uh, trichogramma wasps, which I was going to make my millions out of, uh, maintaining um, heliothus, you know, for heliothus control. But unfortunately uh, for me, um, the BT cotton gene came out at the same time, which is a much better way to solve the, yeah. prob- solve the problem. <laughs> but they, they again went from, you know, weekly spray re- routines to, I don't know that they often get to zero, but they certainly have very very low uh, insecticide inputs yeah um well someone had mentioned to me that they'd used one in three years which was yeah. as you said had gone from 10 to 14 a year depending yeah. on what was happening yeah yeah it's extraordinary coming back to to the pecan farm so you you ended up going back to it is that right yeah i, I was out for 10 years um dean was was getting old yep um and uh I remember saying to my and and I I'd done my ten ten odd years in public sector research, fascinating time, but uh, I wasn't any, getting any great stories out of it to come home to the kids. You know what did what did what did you do today, Dad? Oh, I had a meeting. Um, I was getting a little bit bored with it, and and the farm out at Warwick was we were starting to kick some goals there, um, getting. You know, had it developed and up and running and, and doing pretty well. Um, so I was just about ready for a change, and I said to my wife, "Yeah, you know, I think I'll, I'll give, I'll give, um, I'll give Dan a year. We'll we'll spend a year on the place, getting it ready for sale, because that's what it, that's what needed to happen." And she said, "Ah, oh, okay, just so long as you don't do anything stupid." And I don't know, Jeff Dodd, who was another ex-employee, and myself came back to try to get it. Heading on upwards and onwards because it slowed down a bit, um, and within six months we'd put in an offer, and uh, within twelve months we'd we'd managed to secure the finance to uh, to to purchase. Uh, luckily, just prior to the October ninety seven financial crash. Yeah, wow. Well. Because otherwise we wouldn't have got the finance. <laughs> uh, did that crash impact you in the business? I remember saying to our banker at the time, who was Rabo, we were three months in, and and things had started to turn rather rather bad. Um, the the and I said to him, he said, how, "How are you tracking?" And I said, "Well, I think we might be right. Just need a few things to go our way. Firstly, I need the dollar to drop from a dollar because it had got to parity, and we were an export focused at that time, predominantly export focused. I said, I need the dollar to drop to sixty five. I need the price of fuel to go from $1.40 back down to $80. Um, I need interest rates to go from 12 to 6 And the, oh, I need the price of pecans to go from $1.75 to $3. But I said if all of those three happen within the next six months, we'll be sweet. Not asking much. No, and, and he, he was rather, rather stressed by that. All of those did come to pass effectively. Wow. Um, and, so um, it wasn't a flipping comment. Coming by you, or was not it? at all? No, no. It was. It was. We we had. It was a reasonably tight sort of uh, position that we got into. But there were way we there were ways that we could have managed um, predominantly through. The first change was to was to double it. If we invested in drip straight away, and managed to get half the water effectively available for sale, so we could have sold. A lot of permanent security water into the into the Guada system, and were in fact required to by the by the bank. But luckily, I managed to convince them not to force that on us, and uh, because all these magic things happened, mm-hmm. 
Um, and that then allowed us to use that water to expand from 700 to 1400 hectares in the in the Guada, which it's now sitting at, at, I think, slightly more than that. And so you ended up going through and, and selling that business, but at the point of sale, you'd developed a 20-year vision for what it could be? Yeah, we. it wasn't my business, and it's a different... Mm, it was Dean's business, and I was really looking after it for him. Uh and so it wasn't something that I saw as a destiny for you know for, din- for family dynasty or anything. And I don't have that view on anything really. I, my, you know, when I'm gone, I'm happy for my footprints to be erased in the sands of time very, very quickly. But we were building it to to take it to 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 sail at some point. Whether it was at five years, ten years, or twenty years, it was it was heading down that track. So. And a very important part of that is to have a vision and have a vision that's much, much larger than your than your than your current situation. So we had a yeah we had a twenty year plan that that saw us with the fourteen hundred hectares, a thousand hectares of macadamias, um, uh, an almond operation and a walnut operation, all all under the one roof. Um, we had the marketing and you know, we had this marketing pipeline, a system of doing things. We had the management team capable of of doing a lot more than they were doing because. Very quickly, you start once you get good people, their capacity to expand their their touch, their their influence, is is significant. And yeah, if you don't keep growing, then they they run out of enthusiasm. So we had this plan, and that's I think uh, as much as anything, when we came to actually put it on the market, it was the assets that we held. Um, but it was this vision of where where we could go that PSP Public Sector Pension Fund from Canada they signed on and in fact part of my brief of sale was there's three things you got to you got to sign up to if you buy this business one is you got to pay the right amount of money which they didn't argue about number secondly you've got to sign up to the vision and thirdly you've got to sign up to the crew that that I've got on board and they signed up to all to all three. Um, and now they've achieved that. They did the twenty-year plan in about four years. <laughs> um, if you pour money in the top end, that rapid growth comes with challenges. Uh, but Ross Burling, who who is running that business now, was up to up to those. I couldn't have I couldn't have run the business that he he has ended up running. Uh, and extraordinary. And he started at that farm. He lived on the farm next door. He started uh, as a. Fifteen-year-old plant mechanic, apprentice plant mechanic down at Trawalla, and he's now running one of the largest horticultural businesses in Australia. Wow! Yeah, so it's pretty exciting. Tell me what retirement was like. Ah, uh, yeah, well, retire. I don't, I don't really use that term, but certainly <laughs> after the sale, um, there was a period of, of maybe not doing too many things, but. I did have a few unfinished bi- things of business. One was I, I had been in the macadamia industry for a very long time and I wanted to grow macadamias. Secondly, I, I, I'd always been exasperated by the grains industry's failure to uh, find a, a vertical, vertical integration that, that, that um, you know, within, within Starman Farms as the pecan operation, we were fully vertically integrated. We grew them, we packed them, we, uh, we cracked them, we stacked them, we packed them into 100 gram packs and we sold them to, to supermarkets and we had mail order and you know we were direct to consumer and direct to supermarket right through the full chain so there wasn't not too many I mean, we clipped the ticket as many times as we possibly could on whatever we did mm-hmm. and tried to stay out of the commodity um, trading environment um, and in the grains industry I'd always you know my I'd always had some engagement with the farm at um, at Warwick and and with others, but when I met up with Stewie Tai in, in Moree and saw what at the time was Bula Farms, the relationship that he had with uh, the Mulster in in Brisbane uh, BBM um, at that time was part of the Grain Co Corp um, stable. He was the first time I'd seen you know at this. This vertical integration that that, that 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 someone in the grains industry who was actually dealing with a customer, as a fo- as opposed to um, the market, and I think if if there's anything, yeah, industries that 
operate within a market, <laughs> stay away from them. Yeah. Um, it's very, very difficult, though. In the grains industry, it's exceedingly difficult. Um, but Stewie had, had really made, made the first step to achieving that. Well, I, and I want to ask you, and it's a, a simple question, but like, so in the grains industry, why is it difficult for them to stay away? Because um, grain is such a, a, a relatively low value product and, you, and, and, and customers don't care all that much is one, is one thing. And customers are, in this sense is, are, are manufacturers or first stage manufacturers. Mm-hmm. So in, with milling wheat, um, and I don't know that industry particularly well, but it's not clear to me that millers care all that much about the grain they receive. Certainly they have uh, uh, some technical requirements, but they have managed to um, technically resolve a lot of the, of the, of the you know, special wheat requirements that they used to have. So they can, they can solve for lower protein, they can solve for poorer quality issues by putting adjuvants and various things in the, in the, in the milling process to achieve a, a loaf of bread and coals and woolies that none of us will, will know was any different? Was any different? So you don't really have uh, customers that care. Is the is the first is the main main issue. Whereas when people are buying uh, nuts, they're they're buying health food, and so I think they they to some extent do care a little bit more about where it comes from. Uh, beef is of course another example of an industry which is. Commodified pretty much, you know, entirely, and and that's an, another industry that I'm involved in. That and I'm you know, it really stresses me that that we've managed to take something that really is quite an extraordinary product and turn it into protein. Mm. And we have an industry that holds protein conferences. I need to nearly swear in that instance. I just just to me, protein for sake. What are we doing selling protein? Beef is the lobster of red meat, and we're selling it as protein. It's the most difficult protein to create in the world. If you want protein, eat soybeans, for God's sake. Don't eat beef. Um, So, yeah, finding customers that care, and the malt industry, uh, they don't care all that much, but they do care a bit. They, yeah. they have they have particular reasons for caring, and particularly around uh, germination and other specific requirements and varietal requirements. Uh, you know, you don't hear millers talking about varietal impact on, on on a loaf of bread. I'm sure that there are there are impacts, but they you you don't hear them saying, "Oh, I won't take that variety to put into them." You know, they just they're just after prime hard wheat, and they're not even necessarily after prime hard. Uh, but the the molsters are. You know, do have specific requirements. They're they're getting smarter and try and figuring out ways of being less dependent upon the supply chain, delivering them exactly what they need. Mm-hmm. They can't get away from the requirement for germination, though. That that's that's a that's a dead set. But as an industry, if we start growing with them, we find that it's easier to talk to us to solve your problems than to go to a chemist and get the, get the problem solved. And your, cust- your ultimate consumer, I think, will be more interested in the problem being solved in the paddock than being solved in a chemistry lab. Absolutely. So, and, and I think probably the listeners might be thinking, well, why are, we, well, why are we talking about macadamias and nut industries and things at the beginning? But I think it, it's such an important context to understand where you've come from. So. So coming across Stu, who we sat down with him and Lyndall the other day, yeah. and, and he talked about understanding who your customer's customer is and then working way back so you can solve their problems. Given your background, what, we, what have you been able to bring to the grains industry um, with that customer f- focus? Uh, I don't know. Not, maybe, 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 <laughs> maybe not all that much. Um, firstly, I think just to give Stuart and Lyndall confidence that there's at least one other person that thought they were on the right track. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the focus of agriculture, uh, speaking earlier today, is so much on doing more, better and faster, you know, just being bigger and better at what you currently do. That's, that's really 
And so actually starting to head off to, to one side and, and not, not, not necessarily becoming bigger but, but more intensive or more, more, more specific around what you do is not, not, not how – it's not where the role models of success in agriculture exist. And that then yeah, is one, one, of the, one of the big things that I make a differentiation in ag is around asset holders or asset farm owners and farm operators. And I think we, we really miss that or mix that up. The real wealth in agriculture has – you're running two businesses, a, a real estate business and a farm operating business. Well, the wealth has been generated up until this point and arguably it seems probably likely to continue – from the real estate business, I find that the most dull and boring um, thing to be. You know, I, I, I didn't grass enter, grow. Yeah, I didn't enter ag to be in real estate. Um, so the operating business is where the excitement, the excitement is, and but investing in how to do that better, uh, and not just buying the neighbour and buying the neighbour and buying the biggest spray rig so you can farm the neighbour, um, that is a different path to, to go down than the, than the sort of standard one. And, yeah, I think if, if anything, it might have been just to give Stuart Mill some confidence that there was a, there was a path to, to track down there. It's, it's not the path that's well trodden, so it's not, not all that easy to, to get down. But, um, and you've got to do the other one. You've got to do the expansion to, in order to stay relevant to your customers because you know, once you've got one customer, you need to find the next one. You can't say, "Oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing, yeah, but we, we haven't got enough for it." You've, you've got, you've got to be able to say yes and continue to expand. How important? So, and I find that really interesting. So, obviously, going, all right, we're going to vertically integrate our grains business. We're going to work with the um, the millers or whoever it might be. But then going, well, actually, how do we make sure we're not Overexposed to customer X, and that yeah. and that's where the scale comes in. Yeah. Well, you, you you've always got the fallback of the market. Uh huh. Yeah. True. You've yeah. always got the fallback of the market, which is kind of the, the 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 bottom the bottom rung. It's the rung that everybody else is on. So yeah, your exposure. So long as you you and in a, in in grains in particular, you will always have that. The, the fallback to, mm -hmm. to to the market position. So, yeah, have, being exposed significantly to one customer is a dangerous thing, absolutely. Um, but you do have some protection uh, in the grains industry, so you you can take a risk. Where do you see it heading in the in the short to medium term? We had made an assumption that 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 uh, that much of this stronger connection between uh, the grower and the uh, end user or the processor would be driven by a, a consumer demand for this relationship to be stronger. Right at the moment, that's not that's not happening. Uh, you know, we we talk about the conscious consumer and the fact that they are interested in in where their food comes from and where their beer comes from and all that sort of stuff. But and that's that is true at a at a theoretical level. But you know, practically in today's Economic environment with inflation being where it is and the cost of living pressure, the average consumer just just you know might want to be conscious, but <laughs> can't afford to be too conscious. So the 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 consumer demand for uh, more transparent supply chains is is not there. But uh, at a corporate level, uh, corporates their investors or their, their, where they're getting their cash from, their, their investment from, be it be it uh, loan funds or, or equity, uh, increasingly those investors, they are interested in, in better understanding the supply chains and seeing that transparency and that direct connection. And not primarily, I guess, on the ESG side of things, the ecological social governance stuff, you know, the investors don't like to be embarrassed by the behaviour of, of the companies they invest in. Mm. But I think generically investors want to see transparent supply chains and, and start to see these businesses that are only operating at a, a commodity trade. Their, their supply chain is simply buying out of the trade. They're seeing those as unstable supply chains and COVID certainly sort of made that clear. 
So I think that's the, the, the bigger driver over the next 10 years, not, maybe not the consumer, unfortunately, because it, there's a lot more story we can tell to a consumer than we can tell to an investor. But It's, um, it's a fascinating point you make there because I think um, in some of the conversations I've heard or been privy to, say, around carbon uh, and people saying, well, actually, it's not, it's not the consumer that's demanding this. It's actually, as you say, it's, it's the investor by going, well, actually, if I'm putting money here, I want to make sure that I'm not exposing myself to, to risk. Yes. Um, and therefore, putting pressure on businesses to start reporting or whatever it might be. And it, you sort of think, oh, that's not very exciting. But the pressure is, is real um, and, it's, and it's building quite rapidly and it's, and it's consistent across all, all of the investment portfolios. I think these sort of really high, high spruiking uh, green investment funds, I'm not sure that they're going to be quite as hot in the marketplace uh, as as they might have looked like they were going to be for a while. But, yeah, just the average, um, you know, the Heinekens and the, and the Asahis, and I would think ultimately the, the large milling uh, companies and uh, feedlot operators, all these guys are going to want transparency in their supply chain and that, that underpins an understanding that, that they're not going to be embarrassed by the uh, ESG position that, that their supply chain's in. So where do you see, and I guess it comes down to maybe a mindset question, but like the mindset of the ag community, especially grain farmers in this, what say the, the next 10 years looks like, as you're kind of saying, that pressure coming from investors around transparency in it. What, yeah, what, what do you think um, we'll see at the, the farm level? And what are maybe some of those first indicators of a movement towards yeah, transparency? I mean, are, are we up for it as, yeah. a, as an industry? People, the people wise, are, are, the, uh, are we up for the, the change of, of attitude? I think, um, I would say, I think we, we probably are in the grains industry. Um, certainly, the discussions we've had within our supply chain network around, you know, would you be interested in being part of a of a, of a carbon reporting scheme, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, it's going to cost you a bit to get in, and all that. Yeah, no, no, it's it's the happening thing. It's it's what don't understand it, don't know where the money is, don't understand, but we've got to be in it. We've got to be part of this. We're part of the problem. We better be part of the solution. In general, that does seem to me to be. Uh, so I've I've actually been somewhat surprised. You know, the grains industry. I haven't been in it for my in depth in my entire life, and I, I guess I look at it doesn't have the the energy and dynamism of some other industries. I guess looking specifically at cotton, it doesn't appear to have that same. But um, I think in, in respect in this respect it 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 does yeah, I think we are we are up for it. Give a grower a chance to interact with an end user and they are very excited because they've never seen one and they, in the same way that an end user's never seen a farmer. Um, that complete disconnect that we've managed to create through the, through these large consolidated trading entities that have put this barrier between the grower and the end user that's created generations of disconnection. When you break it, when you when you when you actually get a a, a wormhole through the, uh, the um, yeah, there's great excitement when you get those two parties together. Mm. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think I think as a I think people wise were up for it. Um, and obviously, the younger generation, I'm, I'm sure, is definitely up for it. But I don't think that I don't think us oldies are going to hold things back too much. No, certainly there's some of the people I've seen, and I think what what I've found really interesting about this Southern Queensland, Northern New South Wales region is, not, I don't want to say it doesn't happen down south because it does, but it certainly seems like there's a mindset here, and and some of the businesses I know Doolan. Agriculture at North Star working quite closely with um, with bakers and, and making sure they're bringing them on farm, as you say, Stuart and Lindell, um, with maltsters and, and whatnot. And I know it's happening, but it certainly seems like there's a, a hunger up in this region to 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 be driving that and and I'll say in control and and pulling levers as opposed to mm. being the puppet. There's yeah, the difference between North, Southern. Australian agriculture and northern, I think, would be. I don't fully understand, but we are younger up here as an industry. You know, it's. 
Southern Australia's got 50 to 100 years on us kind of thing in terms of, uh, of tradition and all of those things. Queensland, we're brash and, and a, bit, uh, a bit young and not very well dressed and don't have, um, don't have brick houses. Um, <laughs> so there, there, is, there, there probably is a little bit. That being said, there's, we're not very good at working with each other, which I think in, in Southern, southern uh, agricultural belt people are a lot better at, at working together and that's, a, that's the... You know, if you want to be relevant to a, to a to a global brand, you ain't going to do it on your own. You're going to do it through through uh, through working collectively. Um, we need to we need to get better at that. With with that customer centric agriculture and farming, and I, and I guess it's a provenance question. Do you see it coming down to um, individual farmers? Do you see it coming down to regions, or is it yeah, brand Australia? Like, what, what do you see in the conversations and things that you're privy to? I think it's um, going to be customer specific, but we have the technology now to make it paddock. Paddock, you know, we, there's there's not a it's pretty much not a load of grain that we couldn't t- couldn't say w- which paddock it came out of. Yeah, um, you know it all. So then you ask your your customer what what do they want to know? Uh, in general, they won't want to know the paddock. They might want to know the farm. They definitely want to know the region. Um, and it's pretty important you don't tell them what they don't pay for as well. So, yeah, just because you know it, don't, no reason to tell them. <laughs> tell me more about that. Uh, it was, oh, I've got oh, these, these things that upset me, but a ticket to play, this assumption that um, traceability in particular or an environmental uh, compliance or any of these things are tickets to play that, that as farmers we, we simply have to, you know, bone up and, and get with the program and, and, and once you've done it, um, then you can then you can join you can join in the in the market and and participate. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember uh, back when I was at Starman's, we we got our we were the second food processing company in Australia to be ISO nine thousand and two accredited. Um, uh, the, the first was another macadamia business, and we were we were about four hours difference in timing between when he was accredited and when. When I was credited, bugger, he he just happened <laughs> he to be clo- he, he happened to be closer to the order than I was. <laughs> um, anyway, it was a big deal. I went it was very soon after this with a piece of paper and my ticket. Uh, I I went across to Japan and uh, thought, man, this is going to be it. This is this is the door. This is going to open the door for everything. And I slapped it on the table and and they had a look at it and said, ah, oh, very good. Now, Mister Durek, the price. And I thought, wow, I haven't. I haven't, I haven't used this at all. I haven't created any advantage for myself at all. I've used it simply as a ticket to play. I had to have it, but I hadn't got a premium out of it. So I think as we track down this, this process of um, traceability and transparency and accreditations and whatever else, we, we need to make sure that the customer uh, actually does want what what we're doing and the best way to figure out whether somebody wants something is that they pay for it. So try not to get into a situation where you're giving something away for free. Is if it's if they get it for free, they won't respect it, they won't use it, they won't they won't value add on it. Mm. Um, you know, that's a uh, I just whenever I hear that term ticket to play, I, I get very stressed and think that's it's not going to end well for both sides because you know we're not getting paid sufficiently to do it properly, and it'll become a, a compliance-based tick mm-hmm. that's a meaningless. There are a whole lot of those accreditations in all of our industries that really don't mean a lot, but they don't cost a lot. People say, "Oh, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, no worries." Um, well, why be in it if it if it wasn't hard to do, then it wasn't worth doing. <laughs> I like that. So, what's the focus for you? Um, over the next few years in the different things, I know you've got the beef side, but also from a, from a grain's perspective, what, what are, through pure grain and others, like what are you looking to focus on and where are you looking to have your impact in the um, near term? Not too much. I, I, I must admit, when you get, I'm not, not, I've never really believed that old, older people had great, had, had a, what's the name in, some, what's the name of wisdom or, some um, experience is not a great teacher. Yeah, you know, it doesn't it doesn't help all that much that you've been around for a long time. I don't I don't think. And so I think uh, we as older members of the 
again, we need to be careful that we're not trying to lay out the the path forward. So I've got no bloody idea what the path forward is. You've got a much better idea of what of where agriculture will be in future than I do. I've got, you know, much, much better. All I've got is 40 years of of baggage that's that's um that's obscuring my view of what the future looks like. You've got less years of baggage that's obscuring your view. So mm-hmm. I don't think it's a strategic direction or anything like that too much, but uh, it's people trying to encourage and, and empower people to, to, to go for it um, and trying to, trying to get new, you know, better people into our, into our industries. I think we, we kind of... Uh, the agricultural club is not an easy club to join. I, I joined it from the outside, and I, I know it's 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 not a club that you're welcomed into very easily. Uh, it's it's not a club that looks very welcoming, or we shouldn't say that for sure. That that's not entirely true. Certainly these days, but yeah, my I think more my focus would be on trying to make sure that that we get smart people in and that retain smart people, and we give the smart people we've got confidence to to do what it is they can do. Um, as for where we should be tracking, I'm less certain that I know where that is. Uh, and as for what technology is going to change the world and all that, again, I don't even know what they are, let alone where they... Where they I mean, I, I still love technology. I still, I, I still love tracking it. But as for the ones that are going to make a difference, I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, but I do think that... Uh, as older members, we need to step back from the driving reins and and sit back more to encourage, you know, empower those that are up front on the on the seat. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for coming and joining us and having a chat. That's um, it's fascinating, and I love that kind of thinking. Um, at the end, there, uh, yeah, I'd say it's a refreshing, refreshing view, but also one that is so empowering, and and I think provides optimism for where the future of ag's going with that yeah, mindset. Yeah. She's certainly going well, has been an awfully fun ride for me and it's going to continue to be a fun ride for whoever wants to join the bus. One question left then. If you were walking into the agriculture industry as a fresh faced young twenty whatever year old, um, what do you reckon would be an area that you'd be looking to pursue today? I'd pick an industry or a sector where you found people that that you where you found people that you enjoyed being around yeah that's the number number one um and you know some of our industries are a bit a bit too going you know, a bit too boy, boys clubby says or whatever else and if that's not your, if that's your scene join it go for it yeah if it's not your scene don't yeah but uh find find an industry that's got people in it that you enjoy being around and go for it uh, uh, but any form of ag is going to be exciting. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. Cheers.